Yep. Give me a nod yeah, when you're ready. Like four, four, Shooter's four, four, ready. Four. Stand by. Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of 3GIQ. I'm Frank Gao, joined by my co-host, Matt Gunlock. Today we're going to be talking about the MCMIC Far East, the Marine Corps Marksmanship Competition. So this is the second MCMIC that the team has done for this season. As our guest today, we have Gunner Daniel Hubbard, Chief Warrant Officer Victor Hernandez, and Chief Warrant Officer Jared Homeyer. And uh, gentlemen, just quick round table. If you want to go through your, do an introduction, hit us with your MOS, uh, what unit you're currently with, and any prior competitive shooting experience that you have. And Dan, we'll start with you. Yeah, so Gunnar Hubbard, I'm with 3rd Recon now. No prior shooting competitions, but I've hosted three while I was with FMTC out here. Nice. Victor? I'm Victor Hernandez. I was a 2111 became a 2120 so 2111 is the armor and as that i also became a 2112 and i was part of the pistol team as the head pistol smith while i was at quantico from there went to marsoc did that's where i did all of my shooting none of it competitive is all i guess professional instruction and then now i'm a 2120 ordinance officer with fourth marine regiment jared Hey, uh, so I'm Jared Homeyer. I've uh, been on the show before, but I'm a 2805 ground electronics maintenance officer. Uh, so I'm the nerd uh, that doesn't have anything to do with shooting uh, other than being a Marine. Uh, but I'm at headquarters battalion in 3rd Marine Division. I'm currently serving as the MMO. And uh, I've got a smattering of IDPA experience uh, that we can all cringe about uh, from 2015 to 2018. Uh, and then since then, USPSA and Tactical Games. And then this was my second MCMIC. Well, now that we kind of got the MCMIC questions out of the way, like how many, because everybody kind of vocalized how many MCMICs that they've been to and competition experience. Um I got to ask a question. How many, uh, how many Marines from your units attended and did you need to sell the event to your command? And if so, how did you do that? And we'll start with you, Dan. Yeah. So we ended up having eight. Yeah. Eight competed. Uh, we had from first Sergeant myself down to Lance corporals, but didn't have to really have to sell the event. Just had to advertise it and then get guys in. It's a busy time of the year for the unit. So it's tough getting, a cross section of all the uh, MOSs, but we had a majority of support personnel from the battalion. Nice. Victor. So let me make a correction. I, I have no civilian competitive shooting experience, but uh, this is my third make make first one. I did 2014, which was still the traditional uh, fundamental marksmanship type of competition. And then last year at far East and then this year at far East. But as far as the unit goes and participation, Previous commander at Fourth Marines was really, he was a competitive shooter himself. He medaled at previous uh, mic mix, and this was something he was interested in getting the unit to do. So it wasn't a hard sell. You know, anything uh, I wanted, he, he was a, uh, willing to support. And last year, we did a good showing to the point to where I think uh, – Four individual medals and, and the team rifle trophy, which after that he put the Mick as part of a teep event that the unit you know will participate in every year. So this year showing up, it was already in the teep, and I just had to put together the team. And we had 13 Marines participate total. And out of those 13, we had three separate teams, two from the HS company for fourth Marines, and then one of our Unit Deployment Program Battalions, UDP East from Camp Lejeune. Uh, Victor 1-2 was able to put together a team, and they had some competitors come out as well. Nice. And Jared? 
Yeah, so um, we had eight Marines from headquarters battalion uh, that were able to shoot. Um, I had a roster of about 11 Marines that were ready to go. Um, but with the Far East Mi'kmaq being the size that it is, our quota that we got was actually only five spots. So then I had to put everybody else on standby. Uh, and the unfortunate part was I hadn't seen anybody shoot yet. Um, so uh, we ended up being able to get some of those standbys in. So we got eight that let us do two teams, um, which was good. Uh, and then my the other uh, ones, uh, we just didn't have the room for. Uh, but the command was very supportive. Um, it wasn't uh, It wasn't a I, – I put together a pros and cons list just to show the commander if he wasn't familiar, uh, but he was. Um, and, you know, getting the annual training out of the way uh, and then getting more advanced – uh, marksmanship experience in some of the younger Marines and then getting them back to the unit to train more Marines in the future um, was the thing he was definitely interested in. Um, yeah, I was a little bit disappointed with the turnout. I mean, my battalion's about a thousand Marines um, and I only had 11 uh, that were like interested. Um, so a little bit disappointed in that, but now my commander, similar to fourth Marines uh, <clears throat> in the past, my commander wants a standing shooting team. He wants Mick Mick on the teep. Uh, and he wants to continue doing it. Um, and he, he, uh, he, he told me I had very wide latitude with what I could do to run the team throughout the year uh, to make sure they were ready for future competitions. So I, I, I kind of look at it as the Marine Corps is a gun culture by virtue because we're a large organization that fights wars with guns. But individually, not everybody is part of that gun culture. So I, I can I can understand, you know, a lot of people, whenever they first come in the Marine Corps, they've never been exposed to firearms training or anything like that. So it's something new to them. And we all know sometimes the Marine Corps makes going to the range in a, a miserable experience. But and, and I think I think what the Mick Mix really do is really expose Marines to to uh, a way of going to the range without it being miserable. We take off all the pressure. We take off all the bullshit. And we we expose Marines to what how fun shooting can actually be w- without all all the pressure from the range. And I think Dan, you know, whenever he was uh, whenever Dan was running the range out there at Camp Panson, Dan did a really good job at doing that whenever he ran the ranges. Um, you know, Marines would come in to do their annual qualification and he had a staff that was professional and and encouraging and, uh, you know, took the bullshit away and it's like hey you're out here to train let's train let's let's not add any extra rigors and let's have fun while doing it um so i mean i i i think that's by virtue of how we do things like we hate the bullshit ourselves so we want to make sure the others don't have to go through that bullshit so um with that being said um did your unit attendees do any kind of prior training in preparation for the mcmick um, you know, Dan, we'll start with you on that. <laughs> yeah, no, we didn't do anything special to bring it together until, uh, except for once the team was formed and we knew who was going to play, we got those guys issued all their stuff and some dry, dry fire time at the armory and work through their gear and stuff like that. Just a little pregame setup, but no actual real training. What about you, Vic? Yeah, with kind of like Dan's situation, 1st Marines has a really high operational tempo. So I had maybe three weeks at the most to get with the competitors and then talk about important things like uh, gear setup, right? And then just just getting them more sets and reps as a uh, doing rifleman skills. So reloads, you know, fixing stoppages, how to use their two-point assaulter sling, how to use their holster correctly, you know, the draw, placement, magazine orientation, magazine management, all those things, and then setting their gear up to be functional instead of, like, you know, comfort-based stuff. So have-to-haves up front, nice-to-haves in the back, everything else removed. But, yeah, about three weeks, no live fire, very little actual at the armory, drawn weapons, and holstering, you know, draws, all that stuff. But it, it's just because of the uh, the work tempo. If, if I was elsewhere, it may be a little bit different. If one of the supporting establishments instead of the, the only regiment on the island, if that makes sense. 
Well, I, I got to ask because you kind of brought up, a, you know, something that I find really interesting. You got you, you 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 got them together down at the armory and everything uh, and and you had them do essentially dry fire skills and, and, and getting them set up for that. Uh, did, would you say that really assisted the Marines prior to going um, to the Mick Like, did it? Did you see any difference between their performance, like uh, compared to other Marines' performances, uh, just having that dry fire uh, progression? Right. So, you know, the reps and sets of doing the fundamental stuff allows them to move, you know, compress the fundamentals and move quicker. So they're not, you know, using as much brain power on the basics. So they could, you know, move a little bit faster, make better shots more quickly and start using that. Uh, you know, that headspace that's not, you know, bogged down with the basics to do more, you know, thinking further ahead for their their stage or thinking further ahead when it comes to experiencing those stoppages, like they're going to happen sometimes, right? And then not being stopped in your tracks when it happens. So it just frees up some of that, uh, that brain power to do more of the advanced stuff, I guess you could call it, but it's really just the fundamentals more quickly. And what about you, Jared? Yeah, so uh, kind of similar. I think I might have got a little bit more time than the other guys. So we did several practice sessions, about an hour's worth, uh, twice a week. I think we got about six weeks worth of practices in. Um, but similar stuff. We started with fundamentals, uh, grip, stance, um, you know, all, all those kind of things so that we could advance. When when I wanted them to be able to advance past all that uh immediately at Mick I didn't want them to have to, to be redoing all that stuff. And we had some people who had never shot a pistol before. Um, and then uh, as we worked up and built on things, we did, you know, moving in and out of positions. We did uh, try to do some target transition stuff. It's all hard to do with dry fire. Um, and then uh, one of the things I'm really happy we, we spent a good amount of time on was like Mick Mick rules and like commands, uh, you know, when you're in the shooting box. Um, so that none of that was new to the Marines and they kind of knew what to expect. Um, and yeah, wildly successful. I think watching my guys compared to, um, some of the Marines who just showed up and had never done something. I feel like it gave them a good leg up. Um, and then, uh, nobody got DQ'd, which is, a, which is a good one. So all the basics, you know, finger out of the trigger guard and stuff like that. Um, we were good. Um, and I think for, for Marines who had never shot a pistol before, um, I think that's a, a really good place to start from. Yeah. Um, so you and I did a lot of preparation for Mick Mick East last year. <laughs> yeah. um, and then did you more or less take the same approach to your Marines for this time around? And then now seeing how seeing how uh, prepared Marines were at the actual Mick Mick, is there anything you change going forward? Yeah. So uh, I shamelessly stole everything that you did for Mick Mick 21. Um, except for we did not have the time to do a range uh, and, yeah. and actually do live fire beforehand. And I told everybody, like, that's what I would have liked to do, but we didn't have time. Um, but, yeah, I, I basically took uh, your – it was your approach that, that we did, you know, even down to meeting at the armory and, and you know, that was kind of logistically easiest. Um, but we had texted beforehand, and I kind of ran my my training plan uh, by you for feedback. And then having done a mic um, I was able to – to incorporate some of my own experience um, straight into it instead of kind of third hand from you. Um, but yes, I, I felt like it went, went really well. Um, I feel like there's a second question there that I don't remember though. Um, yeah. Would you change anything for like the next time that you're preparing Marines to go into a mech? Mac? Oh, um, no, not really. I think, I think generally we did, uh, we did pretty well. I mean, I even got the shop timer out and, and just gave them a beep and had them, you know, run through a, a simple, you know, L shaped yeah. movement with some simulated targets um, just to try to get the, the brain dump that happens when the beep goes off uh, and get those kind of jitters out before we got there. Um, I, th I think the only thing I'd do better or do different if I could in the future would be use an ISMIT. Um, we didn't have an ISMIT available, um, but that might be different for next year. Um, and then, and then more live fire in between because live fire is the best way to train, obviously. But. Yeah. So, so two thoughts. Um, if you can get your Marines out and just get them exposed to dry fire, and it sounds like all of you did to a certain extent, that does a lot. Um, the shooting team can tell which Marines are seeing action shooting for the very first time in their life and which Marines have actually gone out there and gone through their reps 
house and are familiar with the sound of the beep and all the other stuff. And then you also hit on the, the other point I was going to bring up is, um, yeah, live fire kind of validates things. Not only, yeah, it, it validates all the practice, but also the Marines see the progression. They see how much better they're getting from the dry fire and they're more likely to dedicate more time to practicing with their weapons in the armory, just like put, putting that, putting their sights on paper. Um, but wanted to open it up to the group. This next question, you guys have watched the standards and practices of teaching and evaluating Marine Corps marksmanship change so much over time. You've watched, you know, different quals for rifle and pistol, different approaches to marksmanship. Um, do you think the instruction given during the make mix is a step in the right direction? And I'll start with you, Dan. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The progression that we've had in the understanding of how we develop individuals to sh be better shooters and understand their weapon systems and perform with them in different situations is grossly different than where we started years ago. So we're definitely in the right direction and where the Big Mac goes is great. For that to be done at the mass level, it would be a challenge, but it's a great thing. And I think the idea behind the Big Mac of getting it out to a smaller number of participants that can then go back and present that to a larger group or several small groups from their unit is kind of the way that it's going to have to go until we can really package that into a better program. Well said, Victor. So Dan touched on everything, you know, the, the only, I guess, constructive criticism I, I would probably bring to the table would be tailor either the, ru the rules more towards you know, Marine Corps TTPs and less from the civilian standpoint. Like I almost got DQ'd for holstering a pistol because I had to go bend over and pick something up off the ground. Like all my training with a handgun in the military, like the pistol is the safe place to put it when you have to use your hands for something other than shooting. So, and then incorporating some of the equipment, I get it. It may get more difficult for standards wise when we start saying you have to have a plate carrier with plates because everybody has a different version of a plate carrier. Some units may be like I and I units and don't have, have you know, that equipment issued to them. So I could see how competition going slicks easy, but reps and sets using the equipment, you know, really gets the Marines a feel for moving around in that stuff and what it feels like the heart rate, the, you know, the respiration. And if they're in good shape, are they in good shape? good military shape or are they good, you know, looking in the mirror shape, you know, you could be you could run a 300 PFT, but not be able to do, you know, a, a 3k hike very well, if that makes sense. Right. So incorporating more military rule sets, like safe, as long as the weapons safely handled some of the, the competitionisms, you know, shouldn't be tough because that like for me that that starts building two sets of muscle memories i have to do now right i have the stuff i do in professional setting and the stuff i do in competition setting that would be my only thing make make otherwise yeah great great reps and sets for those marines getting using their equipment with simulated uh pressure right that being the time yeah um talking about pressure and you touched on it do you feel like physical duress should be more of a thing that should be evaluated alongside marksmanship? Maybe not duress, but just with the equipment on that builds in that duress, right? Having to move from a start position to your first firing position, maybe 50 meters away, kind of like a, a, a direct action mod qual. And they, they do that for the first time in competition. They'll be like, holy cow, like maybe I'm not in the type of condition I need to be in to do this, you know, professionally. Yeah, the reason I bring it up is, uh, you know, Matt, Matt, Jared, and I, we we all compete in uh, the tactile games. And, like, they'll make simple additions, uh, kettlebells, sandbags, things that are readily available to most folks. And you see a lot of people's marksmanship fall apart when they have to do some repetitions or move those things. And that that's right. kind of what I was getting at. But I agree, like, having having your – it's it's real, it's really easy to run things slick, Um the first Mick Mick that Jared and I did, we had to we had to have the whole flak and Kevlar on. So it's a good time. Um, but Jared, I'll turn it over to you. 
Yeah, I just uh, I think everybody brought up good stuff already. Um, it sounds like Victor will be game to shoot tactical games once we go back to the states because I think that'll be kind of exactly what he's looking for with more more physical stuff incorporated. Um, yeah, and you know, for me, I think the Mick Mick instruction has been great. Um, the the team members obviously know their stuff and they're really good at translating advanced concepts into uh, stuff that's digestible for Marines who have never shot you know, that weapon says everybody shot rifle, but you know, pistol, uh, or really helping them advance their rifle. Um, my biggest gripe for Mick Mick has always been not enough target feedback. Um, mm-hmm. just cause sometimes on the, on the days when you're doing the instructions, um, you got 50 shooters that all cycle mm-hmm. through the same targets and you only reface, you know, once or twice. Um, but with the amount of people that we got to get through the Mick Mick, uh, I understand it. It, I, it makes sense. Um, it's just one of those things I wish we could find a, a slightly better solution for. Yeah, that was, that was one of my criticisms of the MCMIC too. Um, I know why they do the whole negative target thing that we were shooting at MCMIC East, um, but at the same time, I would kind of like to see where my shots are going. But, uh, Matt, you had a follow-on question? Yeah, uh, so old age happened, and I forgot the question I wanted to ask Dan, and then obviously it came back to me. Uh, so uh, you, you mentioned something, Dan, about, um, you know, we, we do this in a small setting, to where the Marines can go back out uh, and teach it to their Marines. Um, what do you think of the idea of having the team guys go out, introduce these principles to like the different coaches course and like really train those guys up, like almost make like a, a an addition to the coaches course with the style of shooting we do and introduce shooting stages and stuff like that um, to where those individuals at coaches that they go through coaches course and work the ranges obviously understand all the principles that we're going to do this and then bring it out to the rest of the Marine Corps. Yeah, no, I think that's good. That'd be good. Uh, they'd be traveling all over the place. And what they do offer right now is the MTT. So they were pushing that a lot for the units. Like, Hey, all you got to do is let us know and we'll come out and spend whatever amount of time you want. You set up the training plan and we'll come out and we'll teach coach mentor participate but you provide the ranges and the ammo and we're there so it's going in that direction getting it into the coach's course will take time but that'd be good because and even just further developing where the coach's course kind of training on the mic mix and the competition and arms program in general just stepping that up a little bit will take it in a good direction and more exposure more time like get those guys out there the they'll get it and Jared, I, uh, you you wanted to weigh in on this a bit? Yeah, so I think one of the things that um, I, I heard it explained from the Weapons Training Battalion gunner in Lejeune before I left, uh, with the move to ARQ, um, the rifle range staff treats it a little bit different than they did with ART. And the position that they put forward was, when you show up to ARQ, you are here to qualify, and that is it. Like we are not here to train anybody and that's why it's less days. So what they were telling all the units on Lejeune was units, train your Marines, run tables three through six, get your marksmanship coaches out and like do marksmanship things. Uh, and all of that was pushed to the units. So and that was about two years ago. And I have not seen a major shift in how units do marksmanship. Uh, it is grass week and some snapping in on a barrel. And then they go straight to ARQ and they get what they get. And I, you know, the infantry units may do it a little bit differently. And I've only been here in the division for a little while. Uh, but as far as like big Marine Corps and just kind of trying to keep my finger on the, on the pulse of all my friends and stuff, uh, I don't see anybody doing it differently. Uh, and I think we're missing out on a lot of opportunities to, to further um, our marksmanship capabilities. So aside from leaving it to the personal initiative of, commanders, small units, what, what else do you think could be incent- can be done to incentivize the push towards marksmanship at, at the unit level? And this is a question for all of you, but uh, Jared, it seemed like you had something that you might have wanted to say. No, it's a, it's a super tough question. And I've been admiring yeah. the problem for like, you know, several years now. Like yeah. I, I don't, I don't have an answer for it. I guess um, I'll, I'll weigh in real quick. Um, right now, Rifle marks. I mean, yeah, I think at, at the infantry units, like if if the unit can go out there and throw rounds and be lethal, great. 
for everyone else in the Marine Corps, the rifle and pistol scores are largely seen as a mechanism for individual promotions. And there's nothing, there's nothing really holding a commander um, you know, accountable to increasing the threshold of marksmanship within their unit. The only thing they're being held accountable for is getting their Marines to the rifle range. We've all seen it, right? Uh, at the end of the fiscal year, the rifle range only has so many quotas and you have this pocket of Marines and you're like juggling and trying to find reasons for why they didn't, uh, reasons that your, your hire will accept of why those Marines didn't go and qualify. Um, I mean, what, 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 what do we think is a, is a way forward? So I have an idea and it's more than just, uh, marksmanship related, but it can be tied to all of our standard based training, you know, the swim, physical fitness, you name it, right? Uh, MCMAP. So make it incentive based. Like if you have, if you perform the top, you name it, you know, percentile, you get a annual cash bonus or, you know, increase in pay or something like that. Make it to where there's, you know, those individuals want to do well because it benefits them more than just, you know, the JPEZ, you know, scores and all that stuff. That That is a, a just an idea. It's not like the end all be all, but. No, I like that idea. I mean, I think the best, the best way to incentivize something is to give money. Like you look at these civilian jobs out here, you know, and I can speak to this. If you're doing a good job, let's say you are in the top 5% or you're you're in the top tier of uh, of civilians, you know, at the end of the year, your bonus is $18,000 in some places. Uh, and, and, and then in other places, you know, if you're if you're low performing, you're probably not getting a bonus. But if you're a mid performer, you could be getting an $8,000 bonus. You know, and so by by focusing on being the absolute best, you get a monetary bonus that is going to maintain the it's, it's going to maintain retention. It's going to promote a, a, a area of meritocracy over, you know, time based. Uh, it's going to get the right people promoted because when people look at money, they're like, fuck, yeah, give it to me. I'm going to be your man. I like that. That's 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 a good way, you know. I I also understand the Marine Corps is cheap, but I yeah. think there could be a way. Uh, there could be a way that it could be done. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll weigh in if you don't mind, but uh, yeah, it's it's an option. I think you'll end up with the same result we have right now when you tell people you're going to get promoted, and when you get promoted, you get more money by doing good. You have an individual desire. And individuals will care because they do. We see that in PT. We see that in McMap. You have your high performers, the guys that care, and they drive themselves and the program forward. And we have that across every field that we're mentioning here. But that doesn't make a unit or a unit commander or the individuals within the unit drive and care about it and prioritize it. We just we need to get the culture to develop into a war fighting culture for everybody. And when everybody accepts that the war fighting capability of an individual, whether that's fighting, shooting, whatever it is, is the most important part of our capability more than how we do other things, then we'll make that actual shift. You can throw money and, th and promotions at the problem, but if the individuals who prioritize that time and management of things that if they make the shift to make it their priority, then it will be the priority. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think we've all been around the Marine Corps long enough to know what the uh, request for more mo monetary incentives gets us. And uh, it's just, there's there's not a lot of it. Uh, we've branded ourselves as the cheat force. So the Marine Corps is going to try everything else. It's going to put pressure on all of us on this podcast right now uh, to get results before it throws money at the problem. But what Dan said, I think is right on the head. It's it's a culture thing. At the end of the day, no, no matter what happens, the Marine Corps is a warrior culture and warrior cultures are all add up with their weapons. Um, like there's there's no successful warrior culture that has disregarded uh, their, their affinity for weaponry and their ability to be lethal. Um, and at the end of the day, like it's, it's on, it's on leaders to, and 
enforce the culture. Culture is a big part of it, and it's on the individual to want to be lethal on their own as well. I I, I have one other thing to add. You know, uh, you know, we were, we talked about throwing money at to create a solution, and I think we all know that that's probably not going to happen. But here's one thing: like as a young infantry guy. Like there's one thing I always wanted. I wanted to go to schools. I wanted to go to SEER school. I wanted to go to jump school. I wanted to do different types of schools. You know, why not make these specialized schools an incentive? Like if a Marine really wants to go and the Marine's performing at the best best of his abilities, uh, he's a top performer in everything he does, then why not throw a lot of these good schools at him? They're out there. We have them. You know, we could we can afford to send Marines to these schools you know, that's just going to create a better trained Marine. Just a that thought. That does happen. That, I, I agree with you. And that does happen. There's commands but, and commanders and units that are absolutely doing that. And they're prioritizing those guys that are the individuals that care about their performance in those skills. It's how do we get the unit to be awarded for the unit caring and mm-hmm. the unit as a whole doing better? I think that would be a good way to go with the question. maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it'd be having to offload some of these annual requirements, right? Like tobacco sensation, how much time is spent at the end of the year getting every Marine behind a computer so they could do their, you know, you name it, annual robot training that provides very little at the end of the end of the day. But yeah, I, I get this problem from the the force design lens, right? Like how are we going to change as the Marine Corps to re- remain relevant to meet that 2030 goal and to thrive in, you know, these, the EABO environment. So you're just going to need better trained guys. So like the Marine Corps is going to have to look more like special operations as a whole. So some big changes have to be made and standards is one of them. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if I were to throw my input on there, I would say that one of the biggest things that, um, and I don't know how much it's being looked at for force design, but I think we need to do a serious reevaluation of what MOS is we need to, to actually have in the Marine Corps. Right. So uh, there are MOSs now that in the past, it would have been different, but now their job can be done hundred percent remotely. They have no need to go forward at all. So if Marine doesn't ever need to go forward, why do I need him to be a rifleman? Why do I need him to do all the annual training? Why do I need to have him do swim qual, rifle range, PFT? And would we be better served to move some of, I'm going to say the thing, would we be better served moving some of those jobs to contractors? Uh, Like how, how many, how many times have you been in an S shop where there's a Marine who's clearly not in standards for, you know, multitude of reasons, but you can't get rid of him and you can't fire him. Uh, but he's not, he's not making you a better war fighting culture. He's not a war fighter. Like what if, what if he was a contractor and you could just get rid of him? Uh, or, or what if you didn't need to care about his physical fitness uh, as long as he just sat at his desk and did his job well. Um, and then the jobs that do need to go forward, uh, we could invest more time, energy, effort uh, in making them better warriors um, and, and really kind of narrow that down. Like Victor's talking about, you know, look a little bit more like, uh, Royal Marine commandos or special forces, uh, special operations type units, uh, where everybody's proficient at those kind of war fighting things. Yeah. You, you kind of stole what I was going to say. Like, uh, if you look at the Royal Marines, the, every, every Royal Marines, a Royal Marine commando first and foremost. Um, and then they go to their basic MOS school, whatever they call it over there. Um, but, for the most part, those are all warfighting functions that every commando goes to. A- anything that's not a warfighting function is pure, you know, purely civilian based, you know, and, and that's a better model. But we also need to hold contractors accountable because half them suck and don't work in the first place. <laughs> no, you're you're absolutely right. No disagreement there. Um, I just I, I look at you know MOS is like oh one eleven oh four eleven. Uh, you know, there's no need for them to go forward anymore. Like, um, just technology and the way that we do things has evolved. Uh, and I don't see the, the point of having a costly Marine, uh, that's counting against our, our authorized end strength and costing us a lot of money, uh, in, you know, all the training that we put into that guy 
when we could just have a civilian do that job. Yeah, that 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 was all I wanted to ask about, Matt. Yeah. Um. So we got grossly off topic, but that's okay because I think it was a good discussion. Um. So uh, I guess I'll start with the. Did everybody here participate in the night shoot? And then if so, how is the competition pushing the envelope on what the Marines can do with their weapon systems in the dark? Um, we we constantly talk about, you know, we on the night, this and that, all that bullshit. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we suck. Uh, and I think, you know, and unless you constantly train in those conditions, you're not going to get better. So how, how, how was it? Uh, Dan, we'll start with you. Yeah, no, uh, I think all all of us were participating in it. Uh, we were all there, and it was good. It was a very simple shoot. It was interesting watching it as it unfolded. We we're all looking at it and going back and forth between the how are we going to do it, and then the lighting threw everything off, so it made it entertaining as we were getting going. And you just as soon as you got up to uh, the position that we were firing from, the background completely fogged out the targets and we were all manipulating through those problems. But is it pushing the envelope? No, but it's a first introduction. We're just getting into it. So yeah, I don't think it was intended to push the envelope on night shooting. It was just to see where people are and get that going as an option, which is great. Let's head in the right direction and start doing stuff at night. We had, I think we maxed out how many they planned on participating in that or close to, so we had good participation in it, but it was a pretty easy shoot overall, like as it goes, but it still added a challenge to individuals and showed them the capability of their systems that they may or may not have ever used before. Victor? Yeah, it, it, it exposed the uh, level of proficiency amongst all the competitors, right? So there's some folks there that when they got to the line, they used the IR flood with the laser. Everything was dummy corded down. You know, you could just look at a person and see if they've used their equipment before, if they're proficient with it, right? They're dummy corded. Everything has a place. If they have a pressure pad, it's in a, a smart spot, not just, you know, in a cool spot, if that makes sense. And then when they got up to the line, you know, lights, lasers, optics, they op checked everything and then used what was available to the best of their ability. And then you saw some folks who you could tell haven't put optics on their face before on the helmet. And, you know, they just had system issues with the helmet sagging over their face or they're like looking up in the air because they didn't adjust it for that additional weight and their laser, like they had the the caps on. So they're like, man, I can't see my laser. It's like, yeah, man, cause you got the safeties on. You gotta, you know, take those off. So the competition's good at, showing where you're at, but it doesn't get the Marines trained up to the, to show their skills when they get there. Like we were talking about earlier, like a lot of bonus is on the units to get the Marines prepared for when they show up to these things. And at fourth Marines, we've done night shoots here. We, we have a night shoot matter of fact, starting tomorrow, once we get back from the, the holiday season. So fourth Marines is a good place, but other places I've been to like, yeah, you, you don't get to use your optics, your your night optics, very often. Hey, Vic, I got a question for you, and this is kind of off topic. You're, are you with Fourth Ridge? I'm sorry, I didn't pick that up before. Yeah, so you you have a uh, Sergeant Major Singley as I your. Do. Yeah, he's a great dude. I love that man. He is. Tell him I yep. said hi. Yeah, him and I got talking because I know he's a sniper and he knows I'm a, I was a twelve, so got talking about the the new weapons and whatnot. Yeah, he's awesome, yeah. dude. And uh, Jared, if you want to go take a hit. Yeah, so I actually, I didn't participate in the night shoot, unfortunately, um, just time and, and commitment. Uh, but I, I will just echo a thing that Vic was talking about. Um, and I think it kind of applies to Mick as a whole, um, but Marines kind of knowing and understanding their equipment. Um, so obviously, you know, we all did some dry fire. We all went over equipment set up with our teams. Um, but you, you definitely see people out there that are kind of like, waiting to be told how to use their equipment and it's like man that's that's your rifle and you've got to keep it in the best condition possible and like that's your optic and like your rco is probably not floating and you know all, all that kind of stuff uh and i think mick mick's really good for that um yeah i just, I, I think it's a, it, it inspires more like ownership of 
all of all of your systems like you're the one who's using it you're the one who's accountable for it you've got to make it work um and like the old art range and stuff like that you'd see marines turn around on the on the line all the time and hand their weapon to their coach and be like it's not working i don't know um so i'm, I'm glad we are working our way away from that speaking of ownership of your systems uh you should always look for opportunities familiarize yourself with gear right jared like if your buddy has nvgs and uh you have an opportunity to go kayaking in <laughs> the middle of night in lejeune <laughs> with them then you should take the opportunity right hey so that was uh, that was a year and two days ago now and it showed up in my uh in my news feed as a as a memory uh because that i did it it was new year's eve that i did that uh all right but, so yeah. jared texts me this is after i get a pvs 14 and he's like, hey, have you ever wanted a kayak with your nods on? I was like, no, that, that thought <laughs> has never that thought has never crossed my mind. And he's like, oh, OK, would you be willing to let me borrow them? I was just like, sure, dude, like I trust you. And apparently you had like you had a really good time. Nope. <laughs> I, I'll tell you, it was it was surreal. So uh, my like mantra for all things tactical is balling on a budget. Um, I've got three kids and I don't have uh, the kind of disposable income that Frank has. Um, so borrowed his nods. Um, but yeah, I went out on Wallace Creek on Camp Lejeune, uh, on New Year's Eve, uh, and kayaked around for like an hour, went like three miles up the Creek and three miles back. And I will tell you, it was one of the most surreal experiences ever. Uh, cause there's, there's no noise. There's no engine from the boat. Like it was just me and the dark, uh, and some alligators maybe chasing me, like hard to tell. You only got a little 40 degree field of view. Um, but it was a really good time. Uh, and yeah, it did help me, uh, you know, I, I spent some time under nods, uh, but you know, more time is always good. Um, there's definitely some, there's definitely a steep learning curve, um, and especially using a single tube optic. Um, but yeah, it was just a really good time. It was a fun challenge. Um, you know, encountered issues didn't think I'd encounter, um, but didn't get wet and it was great. And the nods still work. So, and the nods still work. Oh man. Um, all right. Well, another question for you all. Uh, so being stationed in a place like Oki, it's hard to expose Marines to competitive shooting. There's just, there, there just aren't the venues for it unless you were to hold something uh, on the actual base. So what is the best way to introduce Marines to competitive shooting, higher marksmanship concepts, whatever you want to call them? And uh, Dan, we'll start with you. Yeah, so like you said, it is difficult, but on the base is the way to go. And there's the availability for units to run their own events now. But what I'll give it to the marksmanship unit out here, they're running and they posted three planned uh, competitions through the year already. So they put them in the bulletins that they've got to support and the range is locked on, everything ready to go. And anybody can participate in that. We got that door open. So we will see more availability of it out here. And as long as that stays as a feature that the unit there does, there's an opportunity for guys to come out. Nice. Victor. So like being in Japan, right, they've had weapons are, are highly restricted to the locals as well. And they, they found a workaround through training aids and by training aids, I mean, airsoft. So yeah. you could go, you know, purchase a replica of the, your issued equipment, and get sets and reps of, you know, doing the reloads, draws, manipulating your equipment, all that stuff. You know, I don't know if it's base dependent, commander dependent, like how you're allowed to, you know, maintain that equipment if it has to be on base, off base, you know, however. But that is a way of doing it. And then, of course, going to do my shameless plug as an ordnance officer, like on your monthly weapons cleaning, you could go draw a pistol and whatnot and get some sets reps of doing those same things, you know, add some movement in there in, in between of that, that good cleaning of your primary weapon system, right. And making sure there's no oxidation, especially in this subtropical environment. So training aids, there's ismits, and then there's the, uh, the armory, your monthly cleaning, like you come many times you want, draw your equipment and, you know, put in the work. Oh yeah. Jared. Yeah. Um, so best way to do competitive shooting, uh, is definitely Marine Corps events. And I think starting with Mick Mick is a, is a great opportunity. Um, yeah. And, and like Dan said, you know, they're, they're starting up intramurals out here, uh, and doing more competitions on the Island. Um, so those were major selling points when I was recruiting around my unit. 
um, both from people who had shot, you know, competitions in the States and just wanted to continue that. And people who maybe were interested in getting into that world when they go back, but they didn't want to wait. Um, so yeah. Um, and then like I already talked about my, my unit wants to keep a standing shooting team. So I'm going to be plagiarizing the, the MIG order that Frank wrote when we were back at two MIG. Um, and yeah, I, th I think, uh, we've got, you know, we talked about culture change and, and stuff being personality driven. Um, you know, I can't, I can't change the whole Marine Corps. Um, but I can certainly impart my personality onto things, uh, and, and try to lead things from my level. So. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, you sent me a text like a couple of weeks ago about like basically running US PSA matches. Uh, is that something you guys are looking at doing or are you just looking to do more like action shooting oriented stuff? Yeah, just kind of flirting with ideas because I keep not meddling at Mick Mix. So if I figure if yeah. I put together uh, an officially <laughs> if I put together an officially sanctioned match, uh, you know, uh, maybe I can have more opportunities to get a medal. Uh, um. Yeah. It's in, Matt. Matt, what do you think? Does it does it necessarily have to be sanctioned with USPSA, or if it just simply adopts the USPSA rule set? Would that? I, it would really be up to so, the current shooting team staff and CYC, wouldn't it? It would. I mean, I think the best way to go around it is this. That it's a very touchy subject. Uh, I'll say that. Um, if I were to do that. I would start my own USPSA club, get sanctioned by USPSA um, to do it. That way you're running USPSA rule sets, all that kind of stuff. That way it's not just a unit driven thing, because when things are just unit driven, um, it provides a bit of. Uh, it, it, it just doesn't look right whenever it's just a unit. And right. we've, we've seen it. We've seen it in the past where a unit has done something and it was really hard to decipher like, okay, what are you actually doing? And then all they really did was take the scores from a CPP and they were like, they submitted those scores and like, Oh, these guys. Uh. And, and so if you adopt a USPSA club out there, actually officially sanction it through USPSA and then um, get it running, then, you know, submit the scores from there. It, it'd be a little bit more kosher. Not just saying, oh, this is a unit match. That's yeah. how I would go about it. And there's an idea for you. And a lot of the classifiers are stand and deliver. So those are easy to set up. Um, but uh, you, so it's great to hear that competitive shooting is starting to take root in Oki. Uh, what we're starting to see is, you know, the Marine Corps shoot team goes around and they do the big mix. And we're starting to see that affect the intramurals happening at each base. For example, uh, Stone Bay just ran an intramural that was entire action shooting. Uh, it was run by Parker Tomasi. We had him on a few episodes back. He's the ops over there right now. And I was in his office when his CEO came in and said, hey, this was actually really fun. Can we just run these on our own? So it's starting to take root across the Marine Corps uh, at a small level. I think the next step is just to you know give that give that support because it's not easy to put on a match. Like it, it's an additional responsibility on top of what all the other things that those Marines are already doing, but also getting Marines out to those events in the first place. So yeah, that's, that's really outstanding to hear. Yeah. I, I guess one thing I'll add to, you know, talking about like starting your own club uh, one, like if you go the USPSA route, um, a good thing is that they have multi-gun rules, so it could be a two-gun match rather than just a pistol match. And and then one thing that you would have to do, and this is a USPSA rule, said it has to be open to ev anybody. Uh, so it can't just be your unit. It has to be open up to units across the board. But, I mean, really all that requires you is saying, hey, we're going to be doing this range function here during this time. We're going to have these issued weapons. This is these, – these are – these are like the wickets we're going to hit. These are the TNR events that we're going to hit essentially. That way it can be kind of official Marine Corps, but it's same because you're going to be using Marine Corps weapons and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, you're going to be doing skills that are going to progress past the TNR events. Uh, and then you can open it up to other units. That way it can make it fair across the board. Just, just some thoughts. Um, yeah, no, it was a, it was some pretty early ideas that I was just kind of kicking around, just trying to see what the options were. Um, and that was, uh, I'm not on Gunnar Hagen's distro list for the intramurals. So I gotta, I gotta do a little digging to find that. Um, so I'm, I'm glad Dan brought that up because I was kind of looking out for it and hadn't seen it yet. Um, but yeah, just, just trying to increase the amount of opportunities. 
And ultimately, I think there are a lot of Marines out here that would be eager to compete. Um, and, and if they're not, I think there's stuff that we can do as leaders to make it um, appetizing so Marines are eager to compete. Um, and I think that kind of gets to all the, the goals that we've all talked about to build a, a war fighting and marksmanship culture uh, that everybody wants to participate in. I mean, the way I would kind of look at it is like, you know, I'm not saying you three lead the effort, but like get with your whole community and be like, hey, this is what we want to do. And like you can host a match every weekend, every other weekend, whether it's Camp Hansen, Camp Schwab, somewhere on Okinawa. And then be like, hey, on this Saturday, we're going to host this match here. And then each each time you do it, somebody kind of takes the reins and, hey, I'm the lead on this event or in next one, you'll be the lead on that. That way it kind of splits uh, splits the, the weight of all the planning for it. But and once the planning is done, it's kind of just regurgitating and plagiarizing for the next one. Speaking of plagiarizing, I mean, you could always reach out to Stone Bay and ask them for their, you know, uh, stage designs. And then um, also the the shooting team themselves, the uh, Quantico Shooting Club, holds a match every single every single month. Granted, they have bays, so it's a little different. But, yeah. All right, so. Uh, last question for you guys. Uh, if if I'm a Marine looking to attend my first MCMIC, what's some advice you'd give me uh, on maximizing training value and giving myself the best chance of earning a medal? Uh, Jared, we'll start with you. Yeah, so uh, I would say do everything fast and then shoot slow. Uh, like practicing and maximizing efficiency is a, is a really key part. Um, you know, making sure your gear setup is smart and, and works. Um, even going back and watching the videos of how I did like some of the action rifle stages, uh, um, I, I thought I was moving fast. Uh, but no, like we had a we had a start no, position that was in a JLTV and then moved like I don't know ten or twelve yards to the to the shooting box. And when I look back and watch me cross that twelve yards, it looks so slow, and I, I just could have pushed way faster. Um, and then the the shooting was like a decent speed. I, I was pretty happy with that. But it was everything in between uh, that I could have been speeding up. Um, and then, you know, if it's, if it's a Marine on his first Mi'kmaq, I would say to really listen to the instruction. Um, everybody else will probably kind of echo this, but it was, it was, uh, amusing and frustrating to watch the pistol team talk about a technique. Uh, like let's say you're leaned over hard to, to engage a target and then they drop step out of that position to run to the next one. And they, they talk about it. They explain the purpose, they explain how to do it. Uh, and then they set up a drill and they go to run that squad through that drill. And the first 10 shooters are all in this hard lean and then slowly come out of it. And they just, they didn't even drop step. And like, they're, they're giving you lots of tools to put in your toolbox so that you have all these different you want your stuff uh, out the car. techniques that you can use during the stage. And then Marines just weren't, weren't doing it. And I, th I think part of it is, you know, the brain dump that happens when the beep goes off uh, and getting more reps of doing that is good. Um, but yeah, the, the shooting team guys teach, good techniques um, and good tools to have in the toolbox. Um, but you got to listen, you got to use them. Vic. Yeah. So like individual actions, once you internalize, you know, yourself of becoming a professional military practitioner, uh, you'll put in the time, right? So I, I tell them if, if you're going to use issue equipment or if the issue equipment isn't working, make that one time professional purchase of that item that's gonna work for you. Like Marine Corps on and off issues a speed reload for the primary, right? So what I just did, spent the 30 bucks and got a primary speed reload pouch that I keep with me everywhere I go. So my gear setup, whether I'm using issued equipment or my own personal belt mirrors each other. Like there's, there's no difference. And just make those small professional purchases. And then all the tools they give you aren't, going to do much if you don't use them right so you need to put in the time of practicing the drop step practicing your speed reload for the handgun speed reload for the primary holstering drawing from the holster reholding, you know doing them over and over and over and over to where like i talked about at the beginning of our uh, conversation you don't have to spend that mental bandwidth on the basics and you could speed up all the fundamentals that that's that's would be my advice for that first time shooter. One, look at your gear and do you have everything you need to be successful? If not, 
believe it or not, Okinawa has a pretty prolific, you know, tactical equipment scene. You could get whatever you need for dirt cheap and put in the time, personal time. You know, you may have to sacrifice a couple hours on, on war zone or whatever, but actually do those reloads in real life, you know, actually, you know, put the equipment on, see how it feels. Is your holster attached to your leg or is it attached to a belt directly? Like find what works for you, but you need to use the equipment. You need to get sets and reps in it. Dan. Yeah, no, uh, I think everybody's got the right points to the gear thing. I'd say absolutely having something that works for you is the right answer, whether you go and buy it or you just train to what you have and you make that work which is the more important part, whatever you're going to use, you just need to be proficient with it. So individual practice in knowing your stuff and having it set up decently. So I'd say going into your first mic just pay attention, know your gear, watch a couple of things, understand the rules and the efforts. I think that's probably the biggest one that gets guys like guys will come out that are really good at shooting, have the skills that are required, but they'll come out there and they'll have no idea what is actually going to get them points and they'll spend too much time being more accurate than they need to be to be successful in a time limit that's going to get them more points to win, which is where it kind of divides up and the multiple different styles of how the matches are run and whether we're doing a Virginia count or uh, time plus points or whatever, guys need to understand what that means and how they need to adapt to score for that. No, nice. I appreciate that. Yeah. So does uh, we'll, we'll go around the horn. Um, appreciate your guys' time. But uh, any last words you have for the audience, uh, for the listeners? Um, Jared, we'll start with you. No, uh, nothing, nothing in particular. I just want to say thanks for having us on. Uh, special thanks to the Hanson Range staff and the Marine Corps shooting team for putting on a good mic mic. Um, yeah, looking forward to. Uh, working with some of the people that I met out there, including you guys on, you know, future events and, and seeing you guys out there and being able to compete. Um, yeah, that's it. Victor, any last, uh, any last words? I just appreciate the invite. Thank you. Dan. Yeah, absolutely. No, thanks for having us. Uh, great talking. Probably do it again another time. Yeah, this was good. Hell yeah. It was good seeing you all again. Yeah, man. Yeah. Again, thank you all for your time. Uh, for our listeners, we're going to continue to cover the Make Mix as we proceed throughout 2023. Uh, continue to draw in competitors and get their get their sense of how the competition went. Um, but it's also a way of preparing all of you who intend to shoot the Make Mix coming up, uh, Pacific, West, and East, so and potentially championships. So appreciate you all listening and, and uh, let us know how we're doing. Have a good one.